navigating um, any of the um, financial aspect to it, as well as, you know, navigating any of the school aspect to it. So uh, without any further ado, um, let us welcome Eva Zanotto here with us today. Um, I will also be giving you the, making you the host. All right. All right. Whenever you can, Eva. Okay. Thank you so much for the intro, of course, for why not for putting this all together. Um, <clears throat> basically, today's um, session is just to cover a few different topics. Um, if somebody has any questions in between, please do stop me. Um, this is very informal. The idea is to get information out there um, on different topics, specifically for newcomers. Um, and the objective is, is that uh, because in Canada, we have so many people coming from so many different parts of the world. Banking is totally different. Banking is even different um, in some parts of the United States, which they are just, uh, you know, our neighbors. So um, the idea is, is to give some information uh, about the products and services offered at the bank um, or credit union. I'm not um, endorsing any one particular institution. Um, for those of you that are listening, uh, feel free to bank with um, any bank that you wish, but of course, <laughs> go to the green one if, if you wish. Um, and, and, and the idea here is just to get information. So we're gonna go over a few sections. And then, and at the end of each second to interject, okay? So, aside from um, Nick, um, the idea here is to get information about personal finance, which um, now the Ontario government has announced that they will be incorporating into the school curriculum. So, um, you know, the generations ahead of us are definitely gonna have a little bit more information than, than, than some of us growing up. Um, not to mention those of us that do come from um, immigrant backgrounds. Um, in my case, it would be my parents and my husband. So um, the idea is, is that, you know, to try to combat misinformation. Sometimes when we get online, um, when we get on our phones, we talk to people in the local community, there's so much different information when it comes to finance and banking. Um, and the best thing is always to ask a professional. Um, some of us come from places where discussions about money is either embarrassing or taboo. And I think that we need to stray away from that attitude, um, specifically women. In, in, in some places, it's unheard of for a woman to be in charge of the finances in the home or to ask any financial questions because that's left oftentimes to the man of the house uh, or you know, to the spouse or to the parent. Um, and what have you. So the idea here is that personal finance is everybody's responsibility, not, you know, not just male or people. Um, I have a ton of visuals right now uh, because I've been so busy at work wrapping up some things. So if, if um, any of you want to uh, take down some notes or of course um, refer to your uh, website. calculators that um, you can you can do in terms of home affordability savings and we'll get to those section by section so the first part of the area that I want to cover is personal finance personal finance is made up of five different uh, areas and they would be spending which is your day-to-day -day banking accounts savings which is the money that you're not spending on your day-to-day -day expenses investing which would mean once you've saved a certain balance you would then invest the money um, or you would buy property with it. Protection, which deals with insurance and insuring yourself, your home, your car, um, your life, and income is another part of it. A lot of times what we see in personal finance is it's not how much you make, it's how much you spend. And I know that that's kind of a buzz phrase. And you would be surprised how many people have a very high income, but they don't have much to show for it sometimes because they haven't put their bills on time or they don't have credit. 
And on the other hand, you have some folks that are um, lower wage earners, but because of their strong uh, personal finance skills, they're able to have money in the bank, they're able to finance their children's education, they're able to purchase property, um, they're on time with their credit cards. So a lot of this really doesn't have to do with income, it doesn't have to do with how much money you make, it's how do you manage the money. Um, and sometimes that can be hard to navigate it, especially if you're not in the industry and you haven't been formally trained. When in doubt, ask a professional. Any bank or credit union will arrange either a 30 minute or 60 minute consultation for absolutely free. This is what um, the, the banks are paying us to do is to sit with clients like yourself and give you an overview. Don't be embarrassed. Go to your local bank. If you speak another language, ar arrange a meeting with an advisor that maybe speaks your language or bring a friend or family member that can help translate so that you get the information in your language as well. And you're getting information directly from the professional. You have a relation uh, for some of you that have children, maybe you're receiving some bonuses or children when they're coming into the country. Um, things are not easy. They haven't found work and they're on some sort of government assistance. Uh, rather than having to wait for a check, um, you can set up a bank account to receive that money um, or insurances and things like that. It, it, that would obviously come with a bank card where you would be making your purchases either in person or online. There's online banking, um, apps and things like that. So that's the very basic part of it. But in, aside from just setting up a bank account and that's it, um, it would be good to set up some savings so that every time you get paid, some of that money goes into a separate account. Um, a big part of what banks look for and credit unions when you are purchasing a home or purchasing uh, or borrowing in general is not necessarily that you have a bank account and money comes in, but then all of it goes out. I've heard a lot of clients sometimes argue with us, well, my paycheck comes here or um, I, I pay all my bills here. Unfortunately, that to a bank doesn't really matter that much. The bank wants to see that from that money that comes in, are you putting any of that money? The bank wants to see that putting aside even a nominal amount of you know dollars a month coming in but only for that money to come right out um, and I know that in different countries um, different transactions have different significance um, but in Canada one of the main things is that you have an established savings pattern some banks will allow you to set up a service where every time you pass your debit card they would take 25 cents 50 cents a dollar and transfer it to your saving some people say well what's the point of that it's only 25 cents the idea is not really about how much money you're going to accumulate, but the fact that you're showing the bank that you're willing to put aside some of your hard earned money, and that speaks volumes or something like setting up the uh, transfer service where every paycheck or every time you get your baby bonus, you would put some of that money into a separate account and to the best of your ability, not touch that money or only touch it in the case of an emergency going forward, the bank would see that that is a person who is thinking about their future. They have certain patterns in place. Um, and a common misconception is that banks only lend to people that have money. That's not always savings pattern. They don't have a regular, but a large amount of money in the bank is not going to help in that. Um, some of you maybe on, on, on the media have heard uh, things like RSP, TFSA, there's a lot of abbreviations in Canadian banking, um, and I could break those down for you in, in greater detail. Um, the TFSA means tax-free saving. The idea is, is that the money that you're already putting in there has already been taxed because you, the customer, has already received it in his or her possession, but the money that it earns is not taxed. Um, some of you may or may not know that any interest that you earn on money in Canada is subject to taxes. You'd have to declare uh, any amount, basically, is, I'm not sure if it's over 50 or $100. Um, they would issue a T5 and you'd have to put it on your taxes. So the idea of having the tax-free saving is you earn some money, but you don't have to declare it on your income taxes, because I think that we can all agree that we pay enough. RSP has to do with retirement saving. Uh, for some of us, uh, that work for a larger company or maybe they got a pension plan they're going to retire with a decent pension but for people that are working for smaller organizations 
are self-employed. A lot of those places don't have any pension plans in place. Um, and, and a lot of those people are going to have to retire with just Canada pension or uh, old age security, which the maximum today is around $1,400. Most people that we see are getting around the range of $1,100. And I think that we can all agree that $1,100 or even $1,400 a month is not enough to retire um, in a city like the GTA, even if you have two people collecting. So the idea of the RSP is to help supplement that uh, and beef up your retirement, if you will, uh, even for people who have pension plans. Um, we've dealt with a lot of people that work for the city, they work for TTC, they work for the, they get a hoop pension if they're in healthcare, uh, teachers. In some cases, if your spouse passes away, or maybe you don't have a spouse, um, maybe the, the marriage doesn't work out, you don't want to have to have that as a retirement plan. So having that additional RSP um, would help supplement even a good pension if you have one. Um, you know, for, for expenses later down the road. Um, a lot of us also don't want to be a burden to our families or to our, and a lot of people say, well, I can't afford an RSP. It's not necessarily one less trip to, less trip to Walmart, um, one less food order that you don't order. And you can put that money away and you'll see that over the course of, you know, 10 or 20 or um, you know, 10 or 20 or for you later on in life. And whether you choose to retire here in Canada or some people go back home, sometimes that money is, is worth 10 times the amount outside of Canada. So I strongly recommend that everybody open up um, the tax free and the RSP uh, aside from the regular day to day uh, products. Another thing that's very important in day to day banking is credit. There's so much conversation around credit, um, something as simple as a credit card, an overdraft. Uh, you walk into Walmart, you walk into Canadian Tire, no frills, and it seems like almost the bay. It seems like every store is offering you a credit card. What's the benefit? There's nothing wrong with having store credit cards, but of course, a bank credit card or a credit union credit card is weighted to than uh, Walmart or property one day or to borrow money to start a business. So it is important with your bank, even if you start off with 500 or $1,000, um, use it and pay it, pay it on time. And then that way you'll build the credit. Uh, a lot of times people get into trouble by taking too much credit and taking too many credit cards at too many places. So the rule of thumb is, is take one visa and take one MasterCard. Anything beyond that um, is, is extra and maybe not uh, carry them all in your wallet at one time because we do notice that more and more, especially uh, uh, nowadays, people are taking on way too much credit and sometimes having a hard time keeping up and that can really create a, a problem for you in the future. So. What I'd like to do now is now that I've given an overview of some of the day-to-day -day banking uh, products, if anyone has any questions around day-to-day, -day, please do uh, interject. Okay, no questions. Remember, there's no such thing as a silly question. There's, so if you have any questions, do definitely bring them up. I know that some of this is basic information for maybe some of you that have been here a long time. Um, but again, do stop me if you need clarification or explanation on anything else. The next area that I'd like to move into if nobody has any questions on the day-to-day -day component would be um, about budgeting. And I know that there's a lot of online tools and resources. There's YouTube channels. There's, there's so many resources out there to us. Um, and with your local bank, uh, they may they may have the app on the phone um, called My Spend or Easy Spend or what have you. Every bank has a different name for it, but it would be an app that would allow you to kind of monitor where is it that you're spending the most amount of money. So for some people, it's food. Some people tend to eat out a lot or supermarket 
clothing or what have you, is to try to bring awareness for you to maybe cut a little bit of that and put more towards saving. So again, savings is not about walking into a bank with a large amount of money and putting it on deposit. It is about baby steps approach. Sometimes it's a matter of, uh, you know, bringing your lunch from home, making your own coffee or tea, maybe only buying out once in a while as a special treat, um, maybe not going always out um, and buying, um, you know, a new outfit for every occasion. And I know for some people, especially for women, it's a little bit harder than men sometimes. Um, but it's, me, it's making small sacrifices so that in the end you have something to show for it. Um, I can guarantee that everybody on this call works very hard. Uh, and we work a lot of hours. Um, we're giving 150, sometimes 200% at our jobs. What do we have to show for it at the end? And I know that money isn't the be all and the end all, but you wanna be able to make sure that at the end of it all, you've got something to show for all your hard earned work, the extra time. Some of us are on the computer until very late hours of the evening. Um, how many times do we put in effort uh, on a weekend or on a holiday? So budgeting and saving money and being responsible with your money is not only just to have money, it's also to have something to show for um, our hard work. Um, and and it, it, again, it has a lot to do with uh, a baby steps approach. Um, I see that in the chat, there is a question of what are the benefits of having um, many bank accounts? And that's a great question. Thank you, Pastor Francis. Um, you can have a main account where your pay would land. Um, a lot of times couples have a joint account so that they can put money in together and pay the household expenses. Whether or not you wanna keep an account separate for yourself or not, that is your own personal choice, your own personal business. The tax-free savings account that I mentioned earlier is an account where you could pull money out of it at any time and you're not taxed. If you open up an RSP, which is mainly for retirement or purchasing a home, you would be taxed on that money. So I know that it can get confusing, but remember in Canada, if you have just a checking account and you tend to put all your money there, the danger in that is that any money that you're saving is mixed up with your day-to-day -day bills money, gas money, grocery money, mortgage money, rent money. The probability of you keeping your savings is higher if you keep it apart from your day-to-day money. So that's the benefit in having the fee. If you take money out of there before you retire, you would be subject to paying taxes right then and there. And then also when you, um, when, when you file your taxes. So that's part of the thinking as to kind of having separate. Uh, later on in the discussion, we will get to um, education plans as well. Uh, for those of you that might have little ones, um, there's some great initiatives that the government has for people that want to help fund their children's education. And there's a lot of the grants are actually coming out now in July. So um, for those of you that know people with young children or, uh, you know, they want to prepare their children um, to study in this country, um, definitely encourage them um, to get in touch with their bank about an education savings plan. So it's not about having so many bank accounts. I know that it sounds like that, but really every area has its own purpose. And it's sometimes a little bit um, complex and it's just a matter of being organized and kind of keeping things separately. Um, I know that on TV, there used to be a show where a lady would give um, the clients envelopes and they would have a certain amount of cash in each envelope and each envelope was for a certain food, one envelope was for entertainment, one envelope was for gather. You had to make sure that you used that. So now instead of having something like that, people are able to do a lot of these things online um, and keep their money separate so that again, savings is for future. Um, education is for children. Retirement is for when we're older. So that's kind of the thinking around that. Um, so I do appreciate that question. Um, but back to where budgeting is concerned, um, we can see that the cost of things has gone up exponentially and very quickly after COVID. I mean, you can open up your mailbox and the bills have gone up, the gas has gone up, groceries, everything, you name it, and housing. So the idea what you could do is you could go into your bank or on your printer at home or however you feel comfortable is print out your bank statements. I know that everything is online now, but if you have them in front of you, even at your kitchen table or at your desk, and you could go through them and kind of see where are you spending your money? How much are you spending? Where are some areas that you can cut so that you can then put that amount of money, a reasonable amount of money,
get $25, $50, or $100 rainy day. It would help you build your credit. If there is some, and the bottom line is, is you, again, you would have this for the future so that, you know, if you want to reward yourself, you want to reward your family, the money is there. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in personal budgeting, when I get people to print out their statements and they start looking, sometimes some people get embarrassed or they laugh and say, oh my God, I spent so much on this or I spent so much on that. That's okay. There should be no shame surrounding that because someone that is taking the appropriate steps to try to change their circumstance it is already winning half the battle, I think. I, I, as a financial professional who has 15 years experience, I look at my stuff sometimes and think, uh-oh, I shouldn't be spending so much here or there. It, it, there's, no, there's nobody who's perfect in this area. There's room for improvement for everybody. So I do strongly encourage kind of a review. If you don't wish to do it alone, you can, again, always book an appointment and have somebody at the bank or your credit union do that for you, okay? and also where credit cards are concerned. One of the things that we're seeing now is subscription services. So some families have a subscription to Netflix, to Crave, to Amazon, to Disney. Um, there's some other ones. So if you go through and you realize that you've got this Disney Plus, but you haven't looked at it, maybe cancel it or put it on hold for the summer. I know a lot of us are getting together more with friends and family. Our, our church activities have resumed. Uh, our children's uh, sports have resumed. So maybe take a little bit of a break and see how far you get with even just three months without that particular subscription service. If you know that that subscription costs you $20 a month, start up a service with the bank where the bank would then put that $20 for you in a savings account. And you'll see how quickly that money will start to accumulate. Um, Again, I use the example of, you know, food ordering service. I know that we've all got apps on our phone where we can click a button and you could get any kind of food that you like. And as much as it's convenient, and especially those of us with children and we're busy, sometimes it's just easy to do that. But again, if you cut out that even once a month and your average order is 40 or $50 and you maybe decide to, you know, cook at home or maybe pull something out of the freezer, that 40 or $50 in addition with the subscription service that you canceled well, worth dollars a month is, is still very good if you add it up over the course of a year. not to mention one trip to the store um and 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 the list goes on um i think we're budgeting and personal finance is concerned you can make a game out of it sometimes um i know that sometimes when we've got events too it's very easy to run to the store and buy something but how many times if you open up you know even your drawers in your closets you'll find something that still has tags on it um, again, I know that this is more of an issue sometimes for women, um, and, and that's something that's, you know, a good tip to maybe um, look at. Or sometimes the school asks, you know, have your child bring in such and such. How many times have I taken five minutes and looked around the house and I've actually had the item, but I was ready to run to, you know, Dollarama or Walmart to buy the item in question. So sometimes we just got to take five minutes. I know that we're in a very consumerist uh, society, we're all guilty of overspending, but it's, you know, taking some small steps to just make sure that we're not wasting. There's nothing wrong with spending money. Um, as we saw with COVID, everything was shut down. People were not able to save money and as a result, or spend money rather. Um, and as a result, so I'm not trying trying to present um, not spending as, as negative or positive. It's just a matter of having a little bit of and that we win and that, and that we're successful, not only for ourselves, but for our families. So if there's any questions around um, budgeting or making some cuts, um, different tips or tricks that maybe some of you folks are using out there, do feel free to share it in the chat. Um, I know myself, like I said, you know, you know, it's making very small changes on the day to day um, and then having that same money go into savings, not just leaving it in the account, because if you leave it in your regular account, chances are if you don't spend it all on A, you'll spend it on B. The, the idea is to consistently be putting some um, money aside and it doesn't really matter the amount. It's more the consistency that's important um, and then trying your best not to cash it out unless absolutely necessary. Um, I'll give you an example of a gentleman that's actually a client of ours. He just got laid off and he found out that he's going to be off uh, for four months. But during the
pandemic because Um, and for some reason, he doesn't qualify for um, EI. Uh, but long story short, because you know this individual was proactive in saving, now he doesn't have to lose sleep over being laid off for four months um, while uh, the manufacturing is 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 off for, for a while. So, and he'll be able to spend some time with his family. So, um, again, if you have any other questions regarding budgeting, certain cuts that you can make to your day to day, uh, do feel free to ask or interrupt. Um, I think the main thing here is personal accountability, um, asking for help, um, maybe having um, a chat with a close friend or family member to hold you accountable. I know that some families, they kind of have a rule that if um, they're going to make a purchase over a certain amount, they consult each other first. Um, I know that uh, uh, for my myself as well, uh, just because we do have a yes is full of bills. Um, we tend to ask you know, the, if we're going to spend over $100, you know, we kind of just mention it. Do we really need to do that? Is it something that we absolutely need? Or is it something that can wait? Um, because both of us are working very hard. And you just, you know, maybe want to consult and see sometimes hearing the other person say, well, you know, we don't really need to do that. Not every relationship is able to do that because you're going to have some people that might get upset or they might get offended. Um, but that's just an idea that I've seen work a lot of times um, because, you know, another one is the 24 hour rule. There's a lot of people that might see something, but the rule of thumb would be to wait 24 hours, get back in your car, don't buy it and see if you really need it. And a lot of times, either you might find it in your home, you might find it in your storage room or garage. Um, and it might actually be that you won't even buy the item after a while or giving it a second thought. So again, not to discourage say, uh, spending because spending is what makes the economy go around. But nowadays it seems like every single dollar counts um, and we work so hard for that money. So it is important um, maybe just to have that accountability so that we don't overdo it. Um, and then we would have that money for, for maybe a more important um, um, one of the things that um, is a main thing and we don't have a whole ton of time today to talk about, um, maybe we can arrange uh, another meeting on home ownership because that in itself um, is is a lot of information. Um, I have a colleague that is also a real estate professional. So um, we will be arranging that in um, in the weeks coming uh, in terms of a uh, new to Canada or just a home ownership journey. And some of the things that the banks and credit unions do look for when you are purchasing a home. Um, I can touch a little bit on that today. Um, uh, this is, We're not really adhering to anything really strict. Um, remember any questions that you have, whether it be about banking, uh, home ownership credit. Uh, I've had people ask me about Bitcoin. Please, please, please do not feel bad to ask any kind of question when it comes to money. I, I admire anybody that wants to change their circumstances, that wants to learn, that wants to move forward. Um, I would say that 99% of people that come to this country are coming here for better. Um, and it's not easy to leave, you know, to leave your home country and your comforts and your families and we're all rich um, but as you can see we have to work very hard um, for every single dollar and we just want to make sure that we've got the right tools in place um, so that you know we can be successful um, and also give some opportunities to our children as well so um, if anyone has even any home ownership questions uh, I can answer those um, and then maybe we'll move on to a little bit about um, the education plans for the children. But I know that now with the real estate market being what it is, um, I'm sure that a lot of you just on the TV can see that the prices um, in Canada, but more specifically in Ontario have skyrocketed. Uh, and in some cities where prices used to be very affordable, they're becoming more and more unattainable. Um, a big part of the conversation is mortgages and what do you need to do to get a mortgage? Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, setting up just basics in terms of bank account, credit card, savings pattern, 
things like that, sometimes people don't regard that as important, but it is very important. Um, staying with the same bank a lot of times could help you. Uh, but at centers is Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so has been a client for many years. They're not going to approve a mortgage solely based on that, but it is a deciding factor. On the other hand, we have some clients that don't have any dealings with us. They come in through referrals or word of mouth. They've got all of their banking at another bank and they still get approved because they have the income, they have the credit, they have the down payment. Um, but for those of you, you know, that, um, you, you know, you've come here, you've chosen a bank, always try with your bank first to get the mortgage before you go to brokers. Um, that's not to disrespect any mortgage professionals because we are all in this together. Our objective is to help people um, and their home ownership journey dreams come true. Um, the only thing is, is sometimes, not always, but uh, with some brokers, sometimes you have to pay them out of pocket. Um, sometimes you um, have to meet up with them in private locations and things like that. Um, there has been resorts of, uh, there has been reports rather of mortgage fraud. Again, this is not with all uh, mortgage brokers. I know a lot that work with a lot of integrity, but just do your research and always start with your bank or credit union first. They are stricter. They will ask for more. Um, they do want income and time. Um, if you're self-employed and you're not declaring a good amount of income, they might be a little bit stricter. However, they will give you a better interest rate and it costs you nothing. Uh, versus sometimes having to pay a broker, you may have to pay thousands of dollars to get that same mortgage. Um, they may lend you the down payment, whereas the bank will not be doing anything like that. So it all depends. There's no right or wrong answer. I know tons of people that unfortunately didn't qualify with the banks and they had to go to a broker or be lender in the beginning, maybe just for a year or two. Once they were able to prove that they were making their monthly payments, they then brought that mortgage to a bank and they were very happy because, again, the interest rates typically tend to be lower. Um, and I know that interest rates uh, around the world tend to be very high. So sometimes uh, people from outside don't really see um, the big argument on interest because interest in Canada is still pretty reasonable, although it is climbing. Uh, the bigger issue here is the prices. Uh, the prices have skyrocketed and with, you know, even with a million dollars in internet. Uh, but again, what we're going through right now isn't going to last because they're treating this kind of as a doomsday situation and there's a bubble and it's going to burst and so on and so forth. As a person that's on the inside, I can tell you, I don't think that any of that is true. Canada is a country where they have promised to let in 400,000 uh, more newcomers and most newcomers buy a property. The bigger percentage of people that actually own property in Canada are people that are foreign born because a lot of us come from economies and a lot of us come from parts of the world where our families or ourselves, we already own property back home. So why would we come here and, and make somebody else rich? There's nothing wrong with renting, whether it's for the short term or whether it's for the long term. But I would say that most people probably are looking to purchase something of their own so they can decorate it the way that they like. They can customize it the way that they want. Um, there is no risk of somebody turning around and saying, you have to leave in 60 days because I'm selling the place or because I'm fixing the place. So there are a lot of great benefits. Um, even for you know us that have children, knock on wood, such should something happen to us, the children nine times out of 10 would get left with a property versus if you pass away and you're, you're renting, by the next month, you have to vacate and they would have to go somewhere else. Uh, the day-to-day -day of being able to own something or your children or what have you. Um, another main reason as to why people like to own real estate in Canada as, is because of how much it's increased. So maybe some of yourselves own property or you have friends and family who do, and they'll tell you how much they bought their house for and how much they could sell it right now. Um, I don't know that there's too many countries in the world that uh, mirror Canada in the sense that, you know, some people bought their houses for two or 300,000 and today they're worth a million dollars. And we're talking about only maybe 10 or 20 years. Uh, in some economies, it would take, uh, you know, over a hundred years for that to happen. Whereas in the GTA, uh, even markets like Montreal and Vancouver, um, and even some uh, other provinces as well, you know, we have a lot of people coming into the bank saying, I can't afford to buy in Toronto, I can't afford Ontario, but I'd love to buy something in Calgary, I'd love to buy something in the Maritimes, 
I'm not going to go live there, but I'm just buying it so that it goes up in value and I'll sell it. And once I get the money, I'll buy something here. That is a fantastic idea. We've got a lot of people doing that because they've only got a down payment maybe for a place in Calgary. They've only got a down payment for somewhere in New Brunswick. The banks will help you which province to buy in. There are certain properties that you cannot buy or the bank won't fund uh, or things like mobile homes and things like that. But if it is a regular property, um, it is not a co-op. Under nine times out of 10, uh, they will support you. And a lot of people are doing this to raise capital uh, because the down payments in the GTA are, are so astronomical. Uh, just to give you an example, I have a gentleman that just bought something out in New Brunswick. Um, it is one of the maritime provinces. It's very far. I've never been there myself. Um, and he was able to buy a house. Um, it's worth 70,000, but because the family needs to sell it quickly, he was able to get it only for 37,000. So what he's going to do is he's going to spend the summer there. He's going to fix it up. And hopefully um, the real estate said that depending on the upgrades that he's going to put in, he'll be able to sell it for over 120,000. So when you think about the math, he's put in, um, again, less than 40,000. He's bought it cash and then he's going to sell it. So he's going to make a pretty good profit there. And then when he gets that cash, which is essentially where he wants to stay. Um, so that's an idea for some people that sometimes are discouraged or some people are saying things like, I'm never going to have a house here. And that breaks my heart a little bit because I know, again, how much people work and how much they've sacrificed to come here. Um, and they do have a dream of, of, of owning property. Sometimes we just have to get creative as to what we're going to do. Um, in terms of getting there, or some people have moved, you know, one or two or even three hours outside of Toronto, that's what they could afford. The idea was to come back to Toronto, some people are able to do it and other people are not. Um, but again, what's meant to be will be but it's a matter of getting information and thinking outside the box and maybe doing something that um, wasn't your original plan. Um, I know a lot of times, um, you know, we're used to seeing big houses on TV and in movies and a lot of us, you know, started in a smaller place and, and the idea is just to have a bigger home. Well, sometimes we have to decide, is it important for us to have a big home that's very far away from all of our comforts or have a smaller property in a convenient location? And we've noticed now in the last couple of years, people have kind of had to make those decisions. Um, they're not easy ones to make, but, but again, just just because you buy something, it doesn't mean that you have to live there for 50 for 50 years. You could always buy something smaller, wait until it goes up, sell it, and then go buy something bigger. That is usually the progression uh, which most people do in Canada. It's, it's typical for people to own on average up to 3.4 homes in their life. So the first home that you buy, most of the time is not going to be the home that you end up living in for the rest of your life, which sometimes tends to be the case um, in our home countries, right? It's sometimes even a family home that's passed down. So that's one big difference that I notice in Canada versus some other markets. Um, be prepared to buy and sell, buy and sell. But again, nine times out of 10, or in today's economy, 10 times out of 10, you're going to make money. And that money is going to help you move to the next phase or move to the next property. Later on in life, you have the opposite happening. Sometimes some of us with big families or extended families, some people even got, you know, the grandparents or the in-laws. Once everybody, you know, moves on, passes on, children leave the nest, they end up selling these bigger properties and then downsizing and then having some um, cash in the bank, or maybe they spend uh, the colder months back home. So there is a lot of advantages. It seems like a bit of a sacrifice today, but eventually you're building equity. And um, for a lot of the people that downsize, we've got a lot of them uh, specifically where I work. Uh, they've sold larger prop ash and they'll take that money and maybe build a vacation home back home or they've got a lot of cash on hand so that if they need it when they're in their older age, it helps supplement their retirement. Alternatively, you have some people that maybe they'll live on the top floor when they're older because they can't do the stairs and then they've got the basement that they can rent out and that becomes a rental income for them. Uh, and again, if they're spending some of the colder months um, outside, you've got someone there to kind of keep an eye on things. You've got, you know, someone in the home, um, you know, kind of keeping the place occupied uh, and things like that. So there's a lot of advantages to owning property in Canada. The main one being that it is a place to call your own. Um, it is a place for your family to call their own. And also for the fact that there is some money making opportunities um, over the years and it does help 
um, supplement your retirement. Um, other than that, if anyone has any uh, real estate questions, I'd be happy to answer those because I'm sure that there's a lot of them. Okay, well, we have a shy, a little bit of a shy bunch today, and that's okay. Um, you can always email me or get in touch um, through Why Not as well if something pops up in your head later on. Uh, interest rates right now are around 5%, and those are calculated annually. Um, there are two types of interest rates in Canada. One is a fixed rate, meaning that for uh, three or five years or however many years you decide to fix the mortgage for, that rate would stay the same. Um, so in this case, if you sign a five-year fixed mortgage with most banks, it is around the 5% mark and that's calculated annually. Um, so if your mortgage is a hundred thousand, it is 5% of that. And that rate would not change for the five years that you have signed that contract. There are three-year rates, there are one-year rates, there's different rates. There is no right or wrong answer. Um, I don't have a preference in terms of that because it'll all depend on whether you plan to stay in the home. Hopefully, whichever advisor you're dealing with is asking the appropriate questions. Um, in terms of a variable rate, variable is a lower rate, meaning that it is subject to change. It does move a little bit. Um, and that rate is around, it's just less than three and a half. I believe it's 318 um, at the bank that I work at. You can shop around. Another thing that a lot of people can do where interest rates are concerned, um, there are a lot of different apps uh, and websites uh, for, for mortgage rates or bestmortgagerate.com is one of them. There's some on the apps. Even if you just Google them, if you're working with one bank in particular, so let's use the example of TD Bank, for instance, and you're doing uh, your mortgage application there, your advisor tells you that the uh, interest rate is 5%. When you go home, you can let them know that you are going to be, um, you know, looking into different rates. And if another bank is offering uh, a lower rate, do send them a screenshot, do keep them in the loop because everybody in every bank can ask head office for an exception. Uh, I send them in every day and I say, hey, so-and-so bank is offering X. We have to be um, in line with, with some of the major competitors. It can't be a private lender. Um, but for the most part, a lot of times they do honor them. Um, and, and they'll help you get a for a discount. That is what they are paying us for. There are certain processes in place that do allow us. Uh, every penny does count. So do ask them and say, hey, is that the best rate that you got? Can you help me out? Um, I'm new to Canada, or I've got a young family, what's the absolute best that you can do? Uh, again, if you do it politely and you do it in a, in, 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 in a friendly way, they'll talk to their management team or they'll talk to head office and see if they can get you a lower rate. Um, variable is good because it tends to be lower. The only thing is, is you might have to keep an eye on it because it does move a little bit. The other benefit of having a variable rate mortgage is you end up paying more to the, in, uh, more to the principal rather than the interest. So you're actually putting more money on the property versus giving the bank more money. Um, but in the beginning of the mortgage, you're always paying more interest because it is the, is the beginning. So that depends on personal preference. Some people say, well, I don't have time to monitor the rate. I don't work in a bank. You can see the rate on your phone. You can Google it. You can see it on the app. Uh, my recommendation, again, is to try to put more money towards the actual loan versus giving the bank more money. Um, but again, that's a question of personal preference. And once you get there, once you're working with an advisor, uh, you can have, have those conversations. Do not be shy to ask for discounts on rates. Um, they will try. Worst case scenario, if they don't meet it, they can at least come up with an amended amount. Um, and that would still be less than what you were going to pay had you not asked. Um, another question I see, Pastor Francis, very active. Thank you so much for your questions. What is your be uh, best advice for new buyers now? Well, um, from an inside perspective, they will be raising the rates soon this summer. And uh, again, it's set to raise again in September. Um, that's not to say that you have to run out and buy as a result. The rates are going to go up, but in a short time, eventually they are going to come down again. Um, variable, the good thing is, is you could fix it at any time. So if you do uh, shop for a mortgage now, you might want to do the variable so that you don't get caught up with these sky high rates. 
Um, in terms of buying in general, the idea is, is to save as much money as you can for a down payment. A big gap that I see with a lot of clients is um, sometimes the lack of a down payment or not enough down. So, you know, do whatever you have to do, any money saving to Google that you can look up, cut out as much as you possibly can and, and dedicate it to plan um, because down payment is a big part of it. Income. So for some people, um, they've had big blocks of time off as a result of, uh, you know, COVID 2020, 2021. The bank is going to want to see or the credit union is going to want to see that you've got a consistent regular um, amount of time or sometimes there's a family emergency and some people have to travel and they're gone for a long time. Well, that's going to hurt the application. Make sure that when you return, you're back at work, you've got your pay stubs, you're getting regular hours. Um, we cannot use sick time, we cannot use uh, vacation pay, we cannot use overtime. So regular earnings is very important. For people that are self-employed, um, I know I have people in my family as well, and when they were trying to purchase, my advice was for the two years prior or even the year before that you plan on buying a home, you're going to have to declare more. Um, sometimes for self-employed people, they declare less so that they don't pay as much taxes. I don't judge anybody for that. I don't blame anybody for that. Uh, I would say most people do that, but beware that the years that you want to qualify for a mortgage, you want to show that you are making more money. Uh, some people have a business where they're making over $100,000 a year, but they're only declaring 20. The creditors are only going to lend on that 20. They are able to gross it up by a small percentage, but they're not going to use the business activity because everything is then deducted from the expenses. So for those of you that are self-employed or that you know folks that are self-employed, um, for a short time, you know, the advice is, is to try to declare more. Nobody's saying that you have to declare every single penny, but try to declare uh, an amount that would help you qualify. So one rule of thumb that a lot of people don't know is the banks uh, and creditors are going to multiply your annual income by five or six. So somebody that makes, for instance, two, uh, let's say $50,000 is going to qualify for two fifty dollars or 300000 Some people say, well, I'm not going to get anything with that. You can't buy anything. Well, if you've got three people on that are making that, then you multiply that number subsequently. So three people at that rate would be um, $750,000. Well, that opens up the doors. The only thing is, is not everybody has a big extensive network in Canada, um, but maybe there's adult children in the home that have started to work. Maybe you've got a sibling that's renting and you're renting. What you could do is come together, um, buy the property, and then eventually when that person is ready to move on, um, you know, you could remortgage the property and give them their share, um, or you could sell and then each person go. goes into their own property. The idea is, is to get time. Um, you know, the way that the situation is going, the prices are going to change. But again, think outside the box. If you can't afford something in Toronto, maybe even half an hour or one hour outside of the city. You have to think of uh, the commute to work sometimes. For people that are working online, it's a lot easier. Uh, typically, schools outside the city tend to be better. So it, it is a benefit to the children. The community centers are newer. Some of the amenities are actually better. Uh, depending on, on, on where you go. Um, I know that one of the focus on the questions here is new immigrants and low income families. So there are some government initiatives um, for first time buyers. Um, the, the Liberal government did introduce um, a first time buyer. Um, you can Google it and it speaks to families that are making less than $120,000 a year. And there is some help there. You would have to apply through um, the government channels. Um, or you could apply on the websites or alternatively you could, um, there's a hotline on the website that would speak more to that. Um, there are some rent to own programs as well. I know that um, in the local area, there are some condos specifically that are rent to own. Um, so, you know, for folks that are paying rent, you might as well pay. And then eventually what happens is it turns into an ownership situation. Um, the federal government is um, helping with some down payments. Uh, if you do go on the government website, there is some more uh, information about that. There is an application process. My understanding is uh, you do have to upload some uh, working information. Um, it is for permanent residents or citizens. So if you're a non-resident, unfortunately, you wouldn't qualify. Non-resident buying is also uh, another complex uh, topic that we can get into in further sessions.
Um, but typically, if you are a permanent resident or a citizen, it is easier to buy property because you're not subject to as big as a down payment or, or certain taxes that are affiliated with that. And the government is trying to combat money laundering with that and people just coming in and buying homes and leaving them empty. So I don't know if some of you have watched the news and you've seen that. Um, in essence, what that creates is an unfair market where those of us that live and work here are not able to get in because you have people from overseas that are buying people from unmaintained and then it leaves a lot of us in the houses cash whereas some of us have to wait five days for the bank to approve us so that's part of the reason as to why some of those taxes and um and, and things are in place is to try to help keep the market um, for people that live and work here um it says i hear mary many comparisons between between GIC, TFSA, do you recommend investing in both? Okay, so to break it down, tax-free is a type of, of, of plan. As I mentioned, it's tax-free. So a tax-free saving account allows you to put money in. There's contribution limits. In January, uh, the government would have sent a lot of us some papers that would show what your room is. If you don't have that paper, you could call the CRA. Um, I'm going to type the phone number here. I'll type it in the chat. Um, you can call them as well. You can call the Canada Revenue Call Center and ask them what your TFSA room is. If you have a CRA login um, on your My CRA, you can see how much available contribution room you have. Uh, it's calculated from when you turn 18 or when you become a permanent resident. For this calendar year, $6,000 in, up to. If you've only got $100, put $100. If you've only got $50, put whatever you have. And any money that that earns is not subject to income taxes. A GIC, on the other hand, is a type of investment that you could buy within the tax-free savings. So a GIC is a certificate that you would buy with your bank or credit union. Typically, they're sold uh, for $500 or $1,000 or more. So a lot of people, once they reach a certain balance in their savings account, whether it's tax-free or not, it doesn't matter. They would ask the person in the bank to close the money for a period of a year or two years or three years. So let's use the example of $1,000. You would put that $1,000 closed for one year and the bank or credit union would give you two or 3%. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's not a lot of money. And what's the point of doing that? It is money at the end of the day that you don't have to work for and that they'll give you as a result. Um, and then they give it to you at the end. If you take out your money prior to you will not get that interest money to other people. That's the reason what a GIC is. It stands for guaranteed investment when you put the money in, when you're allowed to come take it out. Some of them renew automatically so that if you know that you're not going to touch it for a long time, it'll stay there. It'll keep rolling over for another year or another six months or another two years. So it's not a question of one being better than the other. If you go to your bank and you just open up a tax-free savings account, it's not going to earn any money. Um, bank accounts in Canada don't tend to earn money because if you will believe it or not, we actually have a lot of money on deposit in Canada. Our banks are, are actually full of money. Uh, whereas in other economies, if you leave money in a bank account, they might be paying things like 10 or 12 or even 24%, um, which is what I heard in, in some markets in South America where, where we have some extended family um, and even in the Caribbean. That is because some of those banks don't have a ton of money on deposit. So the money that does come in, they kind of want to reward or incentivize people for keeping money there. In Canada, if you want to earn any money, typically you have to close the money into some sort of investment so that behind the scenes, um, the bank could uh, then lend that money to somebody else and give you a, a piece of that interest that we collect. Um, so if you just leave it in a regular tax free, it's not going to do anything. Aside from investing in GICs, which people can do either for their children or for retirement, for rainy day, for whatever reason, the purpose of the money um, is besides the point. So if you know that you've got a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand, whatever the case may be, you would go into your um, financial institution and ask them to open up the GIC and it would earn money and then at the end it would it would pay out. You can also buy stocks with this money later on once you've gotten a little bit more comfortable with uh, investing with the bank. You can buy things that are called mutual funds, which means that you are giving the bank the authority to then move the money. 
it's not somebody like myself who's an advisor that um, invests the money for you. I just buy it for you. I put the order through. And there's a bunch of people downtown that are buying pools of funds and they move. Right now, we're in a situation where some of those are down. So if some of you have RSPs or education plans, or maybe you're having conversations with people uh, at work or at church or in your local community, and they might say, well, I have an investment and it's down right now. It's because the stock market is moving. Uh, it's very volatile right now. But rather than getting scared, that's when a lot of people actually put money in because it's cheap. It's like as if it's on sale. Instead of having to put a lump sum, you can put a small monthly contribution and it grows. So again, I think a lot of us come from the thinking that, well, I don't have big money to invest or I don't have a big lump sum. That's not always the answer. Uh, statistically, people that put in a lump sum and let it grow actually make less than a person who's putting a little bit at a time because you're buying the investment at different prices. An investment in January is going to have a different price than maybe in December or, or, or in the summertime. So the idea is to be consistent and do what you can afford. Um, I really admire some people that come in and they say, I want to put $500 a paycheck into such and such. If you can afford it, great. But $500 a paycheck is, is a lot of money for a lot of us, um, in, including myself. What ends up happening a lot of the times is people can't stick to that. And then months later, they come in and they cancel it and they, and they throw in the towel. So my advice is, is slow and steady wins the race. If you can start off with $25, $50, or even $100, See how that works out for three to six months. If you like it, you can increase it. You can add to these investments. The banks are never going to say no to your money. Um, you can either add the money online, over the phone, in person. And, you know, it, it almost becomes a game after a while. Once you start to see that money growing. Again, the idea is not how much you put in. It's the fact that you're doing it consistently. Um, and I know, um, again, in the low income markets, it's not easy um, some of the industries that folks are in don't pay a whole lot. We're not expecting that people work 24 hours uh, in order to come up with a down payment. But again, um, you know, even, even certain um, savings plans, I know that outside the banks, uh, a lot of communities do things like partner uh, or in the Latin community consortio, where everybody puts in a certain amount and then there's a payout. Believe it or not, I've seen people buy houses with that. I know that a lot of financial professionals tend to judge those types of programs, but you'd be surprised how many people are able to really change their lives with those. You just have to be careful, obviously, who you get involved in um, and, and that it's a trustworthy source. So sometimes when people come in with that lump sum money that they've received um, you know, from something like this, um, they come in and they invest it and that becomes part of their down payment. The bank is not going to necessarily ask you where you got that money. And if they you do you can say I'm part of a savings club or it's something that I'm doing with my church it's something that I'm doing with some people from my community they're, they're not going to put you in jail for doing that I've had clients get so scared and they come and they put in a little at a time we know that that's something that people do um, as long as you're truthful about it you show your ID you put it in the bank it becomes part of your down payment there's no issues there and I know that some people sometimes are involved in more than one uh, a partner or consortium at a time and they have different payout dates Make sure that you are putting the money in the bank for your down payment 90 days before you get the keys. This is another thing that I tend to see that becomes a major problem. And then people are scrambling at the end when they're going to the lawyer because they're coming in and putting the lump sum right before, you know, they go to the lawyer and get the keys. Um, there are strict rules in Canada about having the money in the bank for uh, 90 days prior. So again, if some of you are sitting on cash at home, I know again, um, in the newcomer market, including some friends and family that I have myself. They have a habit of uh, saving cash at home because they're worried about the government and this, that, and the other. Having money in the bank and having a sufficient down payment is something that is going to favor you. It's not going to hurt you. Um, the Canada Revenue Agency is not just going to go after random people for putting in uh, five or 10 thousand or even 20 or a hundred thousand dollars in the bank unless something going on, you can put the money in the bank. They're going to want to see that you have the down payment in your possession for 90 days. If you don't, you're going to have to run around and go get a job letter. That job letter has to be signed. That bank is going to check that the other person had the money. Sometimes people have to do five and 10 transactions on the same day that they have to go to the lawyer just to meet this condition. So uh, one piece of advice is please do if you have any cash at home or if you're participating in any um, 
partner or, or consortium type of activities, uh, put the money in the bank, invest it, let it earn something. Don't worry that the person in the bank is going to ask any questions. They're just doing their job. And half the time, if you mention that this is going to be part of your down payment, that's a truthful answer. That essentially is what it's going to be for. So um, don't, don't be too worried about that. We've seen sometimes, again, people scrambling at the last minute, and then it creates unnecessary stress on yourself, on your relatives, on the banker for sure, because you know then we're trying to do 101 transactions to justify something that could have been done in one visit uh, months prior. Um, uh, another thing, another question that was touching on is um, home ownership of, of newcomers to Canada. So most banks do have newcomer to Canada programs for mortgages. Um, aside from the permanent permanent residents versus non permanent residents, that that's another uh, topic for another day. But if you are a PR or a citizen, the main thing is is that you get your down payment together. Whoever is involved in the purchase is working and has their taxes up to date. We've got tons of people that sometimes want to buy a home. Um, a lot of times, actually, I find this more with Canadian born um, customers that they don't have their income taxes up to date for five years, and then they want the bank or credit union to lend them money. That's not going to work. Uh, make sure that you have your taxes up to date um, so that we can make that assessment. If you're a business person, you would have to have two to three years versus a personal uh, person or save your T4s, your pay stubs. Um, make an appointment even just to get a pre-approval. So for some of you that maybe home ownership is not in your near future, but it is something that is on your mind. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've had these conversations with people and they say, well, I don't know what I'm going to qualify for. And I've only been here for a couple years or I only have 20,000. As much as you need a big down payment, I always tell people, hey, you know what? Why didn't you come in on you know this weekend or on Friday? Bring your paperwork and we'll see what you qualify for today. We're not going to hold you to that. We're, we're not going to say that you must buy the house within a specified time, but at least you get an idea of what you can afford. And then we can figure out where the gap is. Do you need a co-signer? Do you need more down payment? Do you need to get a, you know, maybe a second part-time job, even just for a short time to show that you've got extra money coming in? If you've got a cash job, maybe you can ask that particular employer if they can start paying you in check. I had that situation with a young man not too long ago that does some landscaping part-time. Um, him and his fiance bought a property. He was getting paid cash. He was able to get his boss to start paying him with a check. And we were able to use that income. So there's no shame in, in, in doing certain things. It's just a matter of getting the right information um, and, and putting things on paper so that the bank and credit union can work with that number. So it says, when do you suggest will be the best time to invest to GIC? GICs, you can buy them at any time. Now that the interest rates on mortgages has gone up, there is a direct connection. We, the banks and credit unions, are now taking in more money in interest. So naturally, if you put money in, we're going to pay you more. Um, right now, again, for about a year or uh, even a year and a half, you can get about 2 to 3 to sometimes even 5%, depending on which institution you choose. Um, and again, if you can keep the money for a longer period of time, they will pay you more. Um, again, I'm not supposed to endorse any one particular, but there is a green bank that is offering 20% bonus if you keep the money for three years. Um, and that would be great for a long-term investor or somebody that has a longer uh, time horizon. And again, it doesn't matter which bank you choose, choose the bank that is most comfortable and more, most convenient for you. I'm not here to endorse any one particular um, institution, but the idea is, is to give you the information and tools to succeed with uh, money. So thank you for all those great questions. Um, if there is any other questions, I'd be open um, or comments or anything, any ideas that you have um, with regards to any financial topic, do go ahead and either um, say it out loud or type it in the chat. Okay, no problem. Um, if something again pops up in your heads, please do. Um, <laughs> I knew the pastor Francis was going to bring this up. I said, it's green. There's a green. <laughs> it is a 20% bonus at the end. So it's not just, if you take out the money earlier, they're not going to give you, um, the 20%. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, if it's for five years, they'll even give you 25%. Um, <laughs> it's the bank that I work for. And it's a green bank. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, and it's called a market growth GIC or market linked GIC. If you Google market linked market 
linked GIC or market growth, you can go and you can look at all the banks. I don't know the prices. I don't know all the prices at other banks, but they're very competitive. So look into that. And that is an opportunity for you to put in money. It's not invested in the actual stock market. So if you put a thousand in, the bank has to give you that thousand plus the bonus at the end. The main condition is that you keep the money for the specified time. If you come in and pull out that money early, there's even penalties on it. So you have to be able to um, honor that commitment. But it is a way of kind of getting into the stock market without doing something dangerous and, and putting all your money on a stock that might not make uh, um, any money back or you might lose all your money. So again, the idea is, is to put it there based on market performance, based on what the stock market is doing, it'll give the bonus at the end. But no matter what, you're going to get a baseline interest rate. So those are our bonuses that they give. Um, we can have another session where we get a little bit into stocks and things like that. Um, again, now people are able to, stay, uh, to trade stocks on their phones. My advice where the stock market is concerned is um, don't get too trendy with it. Do your research. Start off with something that is more controlled or, or managed for you, maybe by the bank first. Do that for six months to a year. If you like that, and if your comfort level, you know, is there with, with, with that particular product, then maybe you can graduate to stocks. On a personal note, um, I've been with uh, the bank for 15 years, and I didn't get into buying stocks uh, until at least 10 years in. I, I'm just a more risk averse person. Um, I, I do come from a working class family, and it wasn't, you know, in our nature to go and buy these, you know, very sophisticated investments. I really wanted to do my research before I got involved. I knew um, how much time and effort it took for me to make my money on my paycheck. And I just didn't want to put it into something that, that was going to um, go into thin air. Um, I would say that the same thing is true for cryptocurrency. There are some people that have made a lot of money with it. Uh, I'm not against it, but just make sure that you do your research and that you're informed. And don't just listen to somebody that says, oh, I made 20,000 or I made 50,000. A lot of times people tend to have these comments and it's not true. Um, or they're just bragging for whatever reason. Um, the biggest tool for success in investing and saving is actually doing it. It doesn't necessarily matter so much as to what you put it in, but the idea is, is that it's consistent and regular and something that you can afford. Um, those are typically people that, you know, who follow that pattern, they end up succeeding. And again, it's small changes to our lifestyle that we can um, make to help make those uh, savings uh, a reality. It's not necessarily about having hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest and, um, you know, being, you know, so sophisticated with your investment knowledge. Sometimes it is, um, you know, something as small as, you know, cutting the subscription services, uh, one less lunch out, trying to make your, you know, uh, coffee and lunches at home, and then taking that money and putting it aside or having the bank take the money and put it in an extra account for you uh, or in an investment that you can't touch. So if you go and you either you do it online or on the phone or in person, have the, let the representative know that you don't want too much access to it because the minute that we can log into our phones and click, a lot of times we can spend it in, in, in one transaction. Um, and again, you wanna have some access in case of emergency, but you wanna have it so that you'd have to physically go into the bank because guess what? When you have to get on that bus or when you have to get in your car to actually go and collect that money, you might have time to think about and decide, well, maybe it isn't such an emergency, right? And emergencies do happen. There's nothing wrong with taking out the money, um, but it just goes to show that sometimes, you know, if you do put aside the money, your emergency will be a lot more comfortable than then having to scramble and borrow or ask people, you know, you'll just cash out your investment or you'll just cash out your savings. Um, and it'll save you a lot of stress and anxiety uh, in an otherwise difficult situation. Uh, I know that a lot of us have relatives overseas. Um, certain life events like funerals and weddings do come up and we have people coming in and sending for that. Uh, and part of how people can do that is because they've saved money. Um, so it's good to know that, you know, even putting a little bit, you know, knock on wood, should a relative, um, you know, call you, at least you have that money there and you don't have to borrow it and pay interest on it, it you know. Um, it's something that, you know, you can do not only for yourself, but for, um, you know, some of your relatives. So other than that, um, I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Um, there are so many topics when it comes um, to finance um, in terms of, again, savings and credit and home ownership. Um, I would like to host something in the summer with a real estate professional as well, and even with a mortgage broker. 
Um, I know that uh, sometimes banks and mortgage brokers compete, but it, it doesn't really matter where you get the house or where you get the mortgage. Or, the idea is, is that you're getting the right information. Um, the representative that you're dealing with is working in your best interest and is answering your questions um, and uh, you know, helping you achieve your, 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 your goals. Um, shop around, go online. Uh, make meetings with maybe more than one representative so that you kind of get different perspectives. Um, there are a lot of great um, thing, resources on YouTube. Just be aware of YouTube that you put Canada sometimes at the end because there is a lot of financial information uh, or personal finance gurus that are American and they tend to tailor their um, advice on American products, which we don't have over here. Um, although there are some good American ones too. So um uh, also, download the app of whichever bank you're with. There's a lot of very interesting tools that you could look at on your phone and different calculators in terms of mortgage affordability. So another thing that I'll type in the chat is, um, can you afford a mortgage? A lot of us in the GTA are paying astronomical rents. So from when I started working to now, the rents have tripled. Um, if you are paying a very high amount of rent, chances are you could probably afford a mortgage. So if you go on a mortgage affordability calculator, sorry, it's gonna ask you the price of the home, how long and things like that. And it'll give you a monthly, um, and you can put the amortization or the, the years at 25 or 30 years. There is talk of Canada extending and making mortgages even for 40 years to help make it more affordable for people. Um, and don't be scared of that because if you're renting today and you're going to continue to rent, you might be paying rent for 40 years. You might as well go and pay a mortgage because at least the place would be yours. Again, home ownership is not for everybody, um, but for folks that are paying very high rent, I would strongly suggest putting that money into a mortgage because again, at the end of the day, if you're able to pay off that property when you retire, you'd only be responsible for utilities, property taxes, you wouldn't be responsible for that rent payment. When you retire, no matter what, you're still going to have to pay that rent payment and your income changes a lot. Um, or if you choose to leave the property to your children and live outside of the country for half the year, we've got a lot of scenarios at our location where the parents only pay for the months that they're, they're, they're in the country because then the children and grandchildren are living in the home. So it works for everybody. Um, banks are not as strict also and credit unions um, as to who you buy the home with. So some people that have limited networks as well, maybe you don't have a whole lot of extended family here. You might be buying with a friend, you might be buying with uh, uh, you know, people at your place of worship uh, or, or in your local community. Typically a good co-signer is somebody who is working, uh, somebody that has good credit, uh, and most times somebody that already doesn't have too many financial burdens. So another thing that I'd like to add uh, before we wrap up here is purchasing a car before you buy a mortgage. So this is something that, again, presents itself as a real problem because the bank, no matter what, is going to see your biweekly or monthly car payment under your credit. The bank is able to see all the credits you have with everybody. Same thing with the credit union when we do the credit check. There have been countless people that we have had to turn down or tell to wait or tell to sell their car in hopes of buying a home because it creates an obstacle. So my advice is, do the mortgage first, and the day after you get your keys, you can go out and buy whatever you want. Try to avoid buying the car first. Some people think, and in some markets, particularly in South America, having a car and making a car payment is favorable because it shows that you're paying your car. It shows that you're complying with uh, some sort of a contract with the bank. Unfortunately, in Canada, it's the opposite because it shows that you've already undertaken a big financial commitment, and you're probably not going to give up your car. So if you're making, let's say, $1,000 a week or, uh, you know, which would be, let's say, 4000 a month, but your car payment is $1,000, that's showing that a big chunk of your income is going towards your car. So chances are you're not going to be able to handle as big of a mortgage. So that's going to lock you out of certain properties that you might like. It's going to lock you out of certain neighborhoods. So beware that a car loan is not going to help you in getting a mortgage. If anything, it's going to hinder you. So what we do with some people is, well, I need a new car. Maybe buy a used car, buy a car cash, uh, finance, finance it under another person for all we care, but don't put it under your name because again, it is going to hurt uh, the application and, and, and the qualifying process. So something to be aware of. Uh, also, if you've got problems with OSAP, 
uh, or family responsibility. Um, there are a lot of people that get into trouble with OSAP and child support. Those are also reasons as to why a bank or credit union may decline your mortgage application. So make sure that you have that up to date, um, including your income taxes. And other than that, if you're working, you've got a down payment, you've got a co-signer, try to see what you get on your own. Um, but again, if you go and you make an appointment with um, a licensed advisor, they will tell you what you need. Don't be scared to ask questions and look up things online. Um, at the end of the day, it is for your financial success. And um, you know, if you have any other questions or anything, do feel free to reach out. I know that it is an information overload. I wish I would have prepared some more visuals, but as mentioned, it's been extremely busy. Um, and hopefully the next time around, I can get some guest speakers um, and some other professionals so that um, you know, we can have other people to ask questions to as well. So if anyone else has any last minute questions, do feel free. Life insurance, yes, yes. Life insurance is never offered inside of any physical location unless it is an insurance office. So if you go to your local branch, chances are that they are gonna give you a phone number because those of us that sell mortgages and investments are not licensed to sell life insurance. The only insurance we're allowed to sell is mortgage insurance. So um, definitely do get a quote. You can even go online. They'll ask you to type in your age. Um, a lot of times they'll ask if you're a smoker because obviously it's gonna be more expensive for people who smoke. Um, and a lot of them are able to offer life insurance without any medical exams and things like that. So uh, definitely do get in touch with um, your financial institution about getting life insurance. The younger you buy it, the better because the premiums are a lot lower. If you happen to be later on in life, um, it might be a little bit more costly, but it all depends on what kind of policy you're buying um, and how much coverage you want. So if the idea is just to have you know, some money to pay for your funeral uh, or, or, or last final expenses as they call them, uh, you know, sometimes the, the, the policies are not very expensive at all. So definitely uh, do contact your bank uh, to do the life insurance. Chances are that you will have to do it over the phone uh, because people inside of the bank are not licensed. Um, but definitely something to think about for those of us that do have children. Um, I know a lot of people have a criticism about life insurance. If you go on YouTube, you're going to see, you know, videos against this or in favor of. Um, if you've even just got a spouse, maybe you don't have children in the home anymore. You know, the cost to bury somebody in Canada is over $25,000. If you want to then be buried in your home country, that cost is even higher. Um, so even if you've got a life insurance, even just for your final expenses, uh, if you look into it, I mean, depending on your age, I've heard of people paying anywhere, you know, from $10 and up. So um, especially those of us that do have dependents and children, um, it is a good idea to have because knock on wood, you know, if something does happen to us, then we do have that insurance um, in place so that, you know, our children are not left <laughs> in the dark, right? So um, again, I know I've spoken for a really long time. Um, do reach out if you need anything else. And hopefully we'll do more sessions with some other guest speakers. And if you've got any questions, um, you know, do present them and do get in touch with me even on the Why Not um, WhatsApp. Or if you want to message me privately, um, I do think that it is important to get information. And again, there's no such thing as a silly question. Um, you are investing in yourself in asking the question. So remember, sometimes some of us get embarrassed about certain topics, especially when it comes to money and finance. Don't be embarrassed to ask a professional what we're paid to do. Um, we are paid to answer your questions. And if somebody rolls their eyes, if somebody makes a face, well, then go to another advisor. Um, and I hope to have more sessions. I wish you all a good evening. God bless. And definitely get in touch with me on the WhatsApp um, or through Why Not or even my email. Um, if you have any other things that pop up in mind or if you have um, any questions regarding anything money related. Okay. Best of luck. Yes. Thank you so much, Eva. Uh, that was really informative. Um, great questions were asked, um, but also really great answers. Um, I think that really helped a lot of people that have joined us today. And I also want to give thanks to everyone that also joined um, on this Thursday evening. I know we're all busy, but again, I'm really appreciating your time to be here with us. Um, I know these are things that many people kind of miss out on and really being able to join us here today um, and be able to hear your experience your expertise, your knowledge um, is, is really great. And I think um, that has helped me as well as I'm hoping it has helped many others as well. So thank you so much, Eva. We will for sure get in touch um, in regards to 
having you back for another workshop, I think that would be really great. Um, I know you mentioned, yeah. and if you, um, I believe it was home ownership. Um, so kind of getting yeah. more knowledge on that would be really great. Um, but really yeah. giving you the opportunity to lead these workshops. Um, so we will get in touch. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much. All the best to all of you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Bye.